own right. Well, take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6 with me tonight. Ephesians chapter 6. Can you all hear me okay? I have a hard time hearing you, but I don't think I have a hard time. As long as you can hear me, then I guess that's okay. Ephesians chapter 6. So I didn't preach last Sunday. I'm not going to preach tonight, so you know what that means. It means you should have packed a sack lunch. I don't think what I have to say is exceptionally long, but who knows? We may be get to going and have so much fun, we just don't want to quit. Right? All right, we'll see. All right. Ephesians chapter 6, just three verses we're going to look at. Beginning with verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Will you go to war with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for for chance to preach your word. God, I thank you for these five years that you've blessed me with being able to stand here and preach your word, your word God. And I thank you for this church and how they love me and my family. And I just thank you for the blessing that that has been. God, I just ask that you give me what I'm supposed to say now. Lord, I pray that you would just guard my mouth and I wouldn't say anything I'm not supposed to. Anything that you don't want me to. And I would have the freedom and the power to say everything that you want me to, just the way you want to say it. Lord, I love you and I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Will you go to war with me? So it is officially fall of the year. You know what that means, right? It's football season. Right? Lisa goes around the house singing, it's the most wonderful time of the year. We love football season. You know, and I don't know, um, you may you may not be a sports fan, you know. Uh, how, many, how many of you love sports? I'm a sports fan. How many of you say, man, I, I can't stand sports, I hate sports. It's all right. It's okay. God still loves you, you know. <laughs> but I, I like sports, um, especially... I like sports because they are a metaphor for life. And it seems like especially football is a metaphor for life. Um, you know, and I, I'm not trying to disparage other sports. You know, if you're captain of your synchronized swimming team of your high school, I mean, I'm not trying to bad mouth your sport or anything, but there's something about football that becomes a, a metaphor life. I, I've always liked sports. I tried to play them in younger days and I, I quickly found out I enjoy watching sports more than I enjoy playing them. It seems as though the Lord has equipped me more for preaching than for being the middle linebacker of the Dallas Cowboys but I do enjoy them because it is a metaphor for life. The Apostle Paul it seems was somewhat of a sports fan. A lot of his writings, he includes illustrations from the world of sports. He includes illustrations about wrestling. He includes illustrations about boxing. He includes uh, illustrations about racing. So it would seem that Paul liked sports and understood that they, they kind of were a parable on life. In Ephesians chapter 6, he has written a whole letter to the church of Ephesus, and he is kind of summing up. And in verse 10, he says, finally, finally, my brethren. It, Paul, this is Paul's way of saying it. I'm bringing the letter to a close. And he talks about the spiritual battle that we as Christians are going to face. And Paul reminds the church in Ephesus, as he reminds us as well, that Christian life can't be lived without a spiritual battle. You say you want to follow Christ, you're going to be
be engaged in a spiritual battle. That's part of the process. Paul keenly understood this because he writes this letter from prison. He is currently, as he's writing this letter, a prisoner for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, as, as a team would leave the locker room to go out onto the field to engage in the battle that is the game, Paul is giving the church a final word. This is Paul's pregame speech, if you will. You're about to go out into the world, church, and you're about to engage in spiritual battle. Here's some things you need to know. The last words before you go into battle. Now, I just got through, Lisa and I just got through watching, binge watching. That's, that's a new term uh, that, that I've, I've latched on to now. We just got through binge watching a season of QB1. Now, if you're not familiar with this, it's a show that takes promising high school senior football players, quarterbacks, that they project will go on to college and be stars in college and ultimately maybe even go on to the NFL. And they follow them their senior year. So the, one, the season we watched had uh, Bryce Young, which was, I think, the number one overall NFL pick in this year's draft. It had uh, Anthony Richardson and Deuce, whatever that kid's last name was, I can't remember, Hogan, I think. Deuce Hogan. Anyway, so two of those three are playing in the NFL and being very successful right now. The other one is the uh, University of but I got more interested in the coach than the quarterback. And especially the one that was Bryce Young's coach. He, he looked, you know, he, he looked like some old grizzly guy that, that was a hundred, you know. And he and he talked with that smoker's hat. All right, team, all right, you know, he kind of like that. He just sounded like a football coach, I should say. And he got his team together before championship game. I mean, this was it. This, you win this, you won it all kind of thing. And this was his speech. This is, was his pregame speech to his team. He said, gentlemen, we face a worthy opponent, but make, make no mistake about it, we are the better team. But they're not going to quit. It's going to be a 48 minute battle. And I want to know one thing. Will you go to war with me? Of course, the team just erupted and they cheered and they loved their coach. And they were, that was the, all the speech they needed to go out uh, and win the game. Well, this is the question that Jesus is asking. It's the question that I ask you today. It's the question that Paul asked the church at Ephesus. That God still asks us today. We face a worthy opponent. He's not going to quit, but make no mistake about it, we are the better team. It'll be a battle. It'll be a battle your whole life long. But I want to know this one thing, will you go to war with me? So, this morning I kind of outlined this passage around football. You got to figure that out. Yeah. So, this is from the pregame huddle. Now, this coach, this old grizzly coach that was leading his team into the championship game, he, he huddled them all up and he asked the team three questions. A series of questions. And each question was asked twice or effect, presumably, and in unison, as one man, the team answered those questions. So, this morning we're going to look at questions of life from the old ball coach. Questions of life from the old ball coach, and the first question that the coach asked the team was this, are you ready? Are you ready? And, they, and the team as one man said, yes. They didn't, they didn't say it timidly. Yes. I, I think so. Ready or not, here it comes. 
they, with confidence, the coach had spoken, and they responded, are you ready? They said, yes. Are you ready? They said, yes. That's the question that Jesus asked us today. Are you ready? Paul says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. In the original language, that verb is passive. In other words, it translates out to something like be made strong. It's made sense because you can't make yourself strong. You can't just decide, I'm going to go charge the gates of hell with a water pistol because I'm man enough to do it. No, you're not. But in the strength of the Lord, you can. Be made strong. How do you do that? In the Lord. Isn't it interesting that Paul doesn't say, be made strong by the Lord? Obviously, it's the Lord that has to make you strong. But how do you get that strength? You have to be in Jesus. It's about relationship. You cannot show up for one hour on Sunday morning and get all you need to defeat the enemy. It doesn't work that way. How can I be strong? You have to be strong in the Lord, in relationship with Him. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. The might is His might. Not, not of you, but of the Lord. Are you ready? Jesus said, before you go into battle, you should count the cost. Jesus said, before you decide to follow Him, you should count the cost and answer this question, are you ready? Because if you're not ready, the enemy has already won. Are you ready? You know, I was listening to Sports radio the other day, um, and they were interviewing this coach, high school football coach, one of the Tulsa area teams, and I don't even remember which team it was. But they were interviewing him, and one of the questions they asked him was, How do you select captains for your team? Do you just go with the best players, or do you? You know, do all the seniors get to be a captain? How do you decide? He coach said, no, we don't do it that way. That before the first game, we hand out a piece of paper to everybody on the team. And we ask this question. Who would you want to go to war with? And get them to write down a name. And then we take those and we tally all that up. And then we, that's how we decide who's going to be Well, let me ask you, who would you want to go to war with? At the top of the list ought to be Jesus. Because he is our victory. He is our strength. But, in addition, look around. Look, look at the people sitting around you. Look across the aisle. This is your team. This is our team. Because the world ain't going to be your friend. We've got each other. We've got each other. And that's all we've got. We've got each other, and we've got Jesus, and that's all we've got. But if we've got that, we've got all it takes to win. We've got what it takes to win. You know, we have to, we have to, we have to look out for one another. We have to take care of one another. We're going to war. Everybody talks about, oh, we just want to be a first century church, first century church. Fine. You want, you want to know what a first century church did? They took care of their own. If somebody had a need, they stepped up and they met that need. They did what it took to meet that need. If somebody had a problem, they did what it took to solve that problem the best they could. Even if that was nothing more than going around, going and putting your arm around somebody's shoulder and saying, hey, We'll get them next to keep your, keep your head up. You're on the winning team. Sometimes we need that, don't we? Sometimes we just need somebody to put an arm around our shoulder and say, hey, you're not a loser, you're a winner. You'll get them next time. Are you ready? Because if you're not ready, you've already lost. Are you 
ready? Now, the second question that the coach asked was this. Will you hit? Will you hit? And the team in one voice said, yes. Will you hit? And the team said, yes. You say, that's a terrible thing for a coach to tell it's a bunch of high school players. It's a terrible thing for you to say to a bunch of Christians, Brother Mark. You're just promoting violence. We don't want a football team that will hit. We want a kinder and gentler football team. <laughs> you know what happens to kind and gentle football teams? <laughs> they go 0 and 10 and they get a jump start on the basketball season. <laughs> football team. Listen, it's not a. <laughs> you said that. Not me. <laughs> I didn't say that. Hey. <laughs> you know, it's not a question of violence. It's a question of toughness and doing what it takes to win. Go doing what it takes to get the job done. When you ask the football team, will you hit, what you're asking the team in essence is, are you tough enough to take the enemy's best shot? And still say in the game, are you tough enough to deliver a blow to evil for the sake of goodness? Football, my friends, involves hitting. If you're not willing to hit, then don't sign up for the team. Following Christ involves spiritual warfare. And if you're not willing to strike a blow against the enemy and stand strong against the devil's best shot, then don't sign up to follow Jesus. Amen. That's what Paul would say here. I don't, my goal is not to offend anyone this morning, but it is my honest opinion that there are far too many cowards in Christendom these days. It seems as though the Philosophy of the me generation has unfortunately bled over into Christianity, bled over into our churches today. That that we become spoiled Christians. That as soon as something doesn't go my way, I pack up my Bible and go home. You don't win championships that way. The worst thing that's ever happened to college football is the transfer. Because what it does is it allows a kid that signs on, commits to a school, who gets in practice and he sloughs off and he doesn't work hard and he loses his starting position. Instead of saying, I better work hard and try better and find a way to win, he just says, I'm leaving, and he goes to whatever other school will take him. That's our world today. But it cannot be our church today. It cannot be the philosophy of Christianity today. We've got to stand and stand firm against the enemy. We have to stand and deliver a blow against evil. Paul in verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God. The word put on it, it's like you would put on garment. I kind of, thinking in terms of football, I think of putting on your pads. You're not putting on armor, you're putting on pads. And he says, put on the whole armor. Every weapon. Offensive and defensive. The full complement of equipment that you have available to you. Make use of it. And then he goes and says, we're, most of us are pretty familiar with, with you know, the list. I told Sandy when she printed the bulletin, I said, I don't care what you put on the bulletin cover, but don't put some goofy picture of some knight standing there with a sword in it. So it has nothing, what I'm saying, it has nothing to do with, with you know, a knight. It has to do with football. So we got a picture of the cross. But you have to too. Uh, uh, you know, I can remember. So I, I tried to play football very briefly, very, very briefly. And, and, and I spent more time in the doctor's office than on the football field. So I, that's why I'm preaching these days. But no, that's not the only reason. But, but I thought as a kid growing up, and I'd watch football games, I thought tackling was about you know, 
running up to someone and trying to grab a hold of them and wrestle them to the ground. And that was a tactic. But when I did play, our coach taught us the proper technique. At least he said it was the proper technique. It worked, so I believe it was the proper technique. The proper technique to tackle. Sometimes I wish that my coach could go and coach the Dallas Cowboys so they could learn the proper technique. But anyway, he said, when you start to tackle someone, you swear up on who you're trying to tackle, and you see their numbers, and you're going, you're going to run as hard as you can towards that person you're trying to tackle, and your goal is to try to put your face mask right between the numbers on their jersey, wrap your arms around them, and drive them to the ground. I'm running around. That's five minutes at the end. That's football. That's football. Here is the thing. We cannot be timid when it comes to striking a blow against the end. We have to square up put our face mask between the numbers of evil and drive it to the ground. You say, how do you do that? March on an abortion clinic. No, that's not what I'm talking about at all. Jesus said, Jesus sent his disciples out two by two to share the gospel. They came back. They were so excited. He said, they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Now, what were they doing when Jesus saw Satan fall like lightning? They were preaching the gospel. They were out telling people about Jesus. You want to strike a blow against evil? Go tell somebody about Jesus. Now, that takes real courage. Now, Brother Mark, if you want me to get a, a, a picket sign together and go march on the nearest abortion clinic, I'll be happy to do that. And don't ask me to tell my neighbor about Jesus. I don't have the courage to do that. Don't you understand the game is almost over? This game called life, it's almost over. The clock is ticking down. The buzzer will go off. Quickly, do you want to spend the rest of the time sitting on the bench? Get in the game. Strike a blow against evil. Be courageous. Paul says, stand firm. Put on. That you may able, be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The picture is not a, of an assault or a hope or a march, but on holding the fortress of the soul. Put on all your equipment so that you will be able to stay. I, uh, you know, when I play, I mean, that wasn't much, but when I did play, you know, they, they had different types of practice for different days. You know, some days were just light practice. So, you know, you wore light, very little pads, you know. And so you come in and you tell the coach, and the coach tells you, okay, shorts, t-shirts, helmets, shoulder pads. You know, that's probably going to be a light day. We're going to do a lot of standing around. We're going to talk about plays. We're going to do a lot of what if scenarios, but not a lot of actual contact, not a lot of hitting. If the coach comes in and he tells you, full pads today, you better take them seriously. You better put on everything that you can get and your neighbor's uh, pads and get some elbow pads and knee pads. They got to wear now. They don't, if you notice this, they don't wear knee pads. Some of them. Like, that's crazy. Why would you do that? I want massive amounts of pads. I want every pad you can give me. And on game day, you got there early so that you can make sure all of your pads were, were just right and then you get your ankles taped so that you know they don't roll on you. Whatever you need taped, you tape. You get ready to go because you're going into war. You're going into a battle. And you better be ready. And that means having everything ready. Because you're going to have to hit and be hit. Friends, we're going into battle. You step out of this 
room right here. You're walking into a battlefield, a spiritual battlefield. You better be ready. Stand firm, he says. Hold on. You know, I'm convinced the worst job in football is the punter. It really is. I mean, because you only call the punter in when everything else is failing. Like the only time a punter gets called out on the field is when everything else has failed. You know, what's our American philosophy? If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. By that time it's fourth down, call in the punter. <laughs> I have seen the punter be called in when the offense had been backed up to their own goal line. Like, if this were the goal line, our goal line, the ball would be sitting about an inch from it. And they called the poor punter in. All right, get us out of this mess. Thanks, coach. So how do you do that? How do you punt from the goal line? Well, here's how you do it. You've got 10 yards in the end zone. So they teach you, they teach the punter, Stand at the back of the end zone with your foot just off of the end zone line. I'm not going to step, because this is when the microphone goes off when I step past this line. But <laughs> you put your, your heel as close to that back end zone line as you can. And you don't back up. You catch the ball when it's sent to you, and you kick it as far as you can, the best you can. But whatever you do, you don't back up, because if you back up, you give the team the other team not only two points but also the ball. So you've just taken a bad situation and made it worse. So you stand firm, you stand your ground, and you take a difficult situation and you make the best of it for the team. Paul says we have to stand firm. Hardly ever in life will you be given a set of perfect circumstances. Life is hard. Life is difficult. It's not easy. The Bible never says it will be easy. And if you start following Jesus, in some ways it'll become more difficult rather than more easy. So you stand your ground and you do what you can to strike a blow at evil, but you don't back up and make a bad situation worse. There's a difference in winners and losers. Winners find a way to win. Given imperfect circumstances, they do what it takes to find a way to win. Losers make up excuses as to why they didn't win. Look at me. You are not losers. You're winners. You're on God's team. You're a winner. So stand your ground. Don't back up and strike the blow against evil. He says that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word is the same word that we get our English word method from. But in, in context, it means something more like schemes or tricks. It's, it's not just the players of the enemy that you have to defeat. It's the plan of the enemy. If you look, if you watch football games, even high school football games nowadays, the offensive and defensive coordinators, they're not on the field. They're up in the press box where they can see everything going on on the field. And they have they call their plays based on what they see the enemy doing. That's, as a player, that's going to make you feel pretty good because you you got to, in your head, think there's nothing the enemy can do, nothing the opponent can do that our coach can't counter. Okay, look. There's nothing the enemy can do to us that the one upstairs can't we just have to get the play in from upstairs and execute. That's it. You can't defeat us. Finally, question. The last question before the team ran onto the field. It wasn't actually asked by the coach. It was asked by one of the players. And it, he asked this question, who's got my back? Who's got my back? And then the whole team would say, I've got your back. Who's got my back? I've got it. Paul says, we wrestle. There's one of those sports analogies he uses. We wrestle. It means to struggle or to combat. It's used to describe wrestling of athletes or combat soldiers against not flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, 
rulers of darkness of this age. In other words, ancient evil powers, spiritual forces. You have to have, we have to have each other's back. We have to. I wish you would look across, find some locked eyes with somebody and say, I've got your back. I've got your back. We have to have our, each other's back. We have to defend the name, the call of Christ. <coughs> this old football coach for the championship game, he pulled his offensive line aside. He said, gentlemen, you've got one job. And their quarterback's number, number 15. You've got one job. Keep 15 clean. You keep 15 clean, we win. No question about it. If you keep 15 clean, we win. What you say to them is, you are the line. You are the brunt. You're not going to be the ones that get your picture in the paper. But you are the ones that have to defend my quarterback. Because my quarterback, he's going to win the game. He's a winner. Your job is to make sure that we, he stays up on his feet and not on the ground. So you do your job and we win. Okay, who's our quarterback? It's Jesus. We have to defend the name of Jesus. We have to say, how do I do that? March on Washington. No. You have to keep the name of Jesus clean. You have to. If the name, we are called by the name of Christ. If the name of Jesus is sullied, it's our fault. It's not Washington's fault. It's our fault. You have to keep the name of Jesus clean and magnified. And if we do that, the enemy can't stop us. If we do that, we've already won. Do that and we win. You say, Brother Mark, I'm no warrior. I'm no warrior. I'm no champion. I don't even really feel much like a winner. Are you on the winning team? So while we were on our trip, we one of the things, one of the cool things we got to do was we toured Fenway Park, oldest baseball park still operating in, in, in America. So this old guy, he had to be like a hundred, you know. He, he's our guy, and he he can hardly get around, you know. And he, but he talked about you know, in the 50s, when he was a kid, he would go around, to, go to the game. His dad would take him to the game, like in the 50s or whatever, you know. I don't have to make it 100. But anyway, he did my point. And so he's going around, he's explaining all this and everything. He had been, he'd been a tour guide there for a couple of decades, I think. He had these huge, two huge rings. It had the red sock. Emblem on diamonds all around him. I mean, the ring was bigger than his finger. Somebody asked him, where did you get those rings? Are those World Series rings? And I winked and said, yes. Where did you get them? And he said, well, I never played. Where did you get those rings? He said, well, I was on the staff here as a guy when they won two of their World Series. He said, in the Red Sox organization, if the team wins, everybody wins. Oh, I know you're not a warrior. I know, I know you don't feel like a champion. You may not even feel like a winner. But if you're on Jesus' team, you are a winner. Because the victory is already won. Amen. And when Jesus wins, everybody wins. Amen. When our team wins, we all win. So you are a champion, whether you feel like it or not. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I'm saying. Hey, we got to get tough. We got to look out for one another. We got to go get ready to hit evil. We got to stand strong. We got to keep the name of Jesus clean. So I ask you are you on the winning team? If not, Jesus. 
Now, I ask you, I'm going to ask you something, and this works better if you go ahead. I know in Baptist churches we respond, we're, we're, we're conditioned not to respond. It'll work better if you do. Are you ready? Yes. yes. Are you ready? Yes. yes. Will you hit? Yes. Will you hit? Yes. yes. Who's got my back? I do. I do. Who's got my back? I, I do. do. All right. Let's go win. Well, that was fun. <laughs> That's great. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, the chance to preach it, and maybe to preach it in a little bit different way today. I pray, God, that you would bless us now during this invitation time. Touch our hearts, Lord.